Today's scripture is from the book of John, John 13, verses 1 through 17, from the New Testament. Now before the festival of the Passover, Jesus knew that his hour had come to depart from this world and go to the Father. Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. The devil had already put into the heart of Judas, son of Simon Iscariot, to betray him. And during supper, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hand, and that he had come from God and was going to God, got up from the table, took off his outer robe, tied a towel around himself. Then he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel that was tied around him. He came to Simon Peter, who said to him, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? Jesus answered, You do not know now what I am doing, but later you will understand. Peter said to him, You will never wash my feet. Jesus answered, Unless I wash you, you have no share with me. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. Jesus said to him, One who is bathed does not need to wash, except for the feet, to be, but is entirely clean. And you are clean, though not all of you. For he knew who was to betray him. For this reason, he said, not all of you are clean. After he had washed their feet and put on his robe and had returned to the table, he said to them, Do you know what I have done to you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you're right, for that is what I am. So if I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have set you an example that you also should do as I have done to you. Very truly, I tell you, servants are not greater than their master, nor are messengers greater than the one who sent them. If you know these things, you are blessed if you do them. Here ends the reading. May God bless these words to our understanding. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Join me in a spirit of prayer, please, this morning. God, Please bless our contemplations this morning individually and communally that what flows from our hearts and minds become lived, embodied expressions of our beliefs, love for you and love for others. Amen. Bear with me this morning as I brag on my mom a little bit, um, for she was one of the great examples in my life. Growing up, we went to church three times a week. And for some of you, you're like, oh, yeah, same. We also went to church three times a week. And some of you are like, whoa, that's three times too many. <laughs> and that's OK. Sunday morning, Sunday evening, and Wednesday night evening, we had services. And we were there. And we didn't just go to church. Oh, no, no. We were heavy participators in the church. Every time the doors were open, we were there, and it felt like more often than not, my mom was actually the one unlocking the door like half an hour before anybody else was even there, and then locking it up as we were done. We would arrive early so she could print off different activities for her Sunday class that she taught or her Wednesday class that she taught. Or we would be, go early because uh, something needed moved or something didn't get put away, so she was going to do it. There were weeks when we would go on days that the church wasn't even open. We would clean the building or decorate something or, my favorite, we would put up the Christmas tree every year. We also 
every year had Christmas plays. And I'm talking like three full-blown Christmas plays that anyone and everyone could and was a part of. And it was the tradition that people liked. People loved to be part of these plays, but no one really wanted to organize it. No one even really wanted to learn their lines, but they definitely wanted to be part of it. And so my mom, being the person that she was, took up the mantle and for months a year poured time and energy into preparing for these plays, reading play after play, trying to find the perfect ones, trying to, to make sure that, that the rehearsals went smoothly, that things were going well, um, and that we had costumes and props and anything and everything else that you need to put on Christmas plays. I told you I was going to brag on my mom. Great example, I think. She did things that no one else would for the simple reason that she loved the church and these things needed to be done. And, amazing to me, she did all of it without getting paid. I don't know how she did all of it. I know having kids, I have four sisters, and they were complicated children. I mean, I was not a handful. I was compliant and obedient, but she had to keep up with my sisters. So she had to be tired, like, all of the time, and still yet being tired, having a full-time job and kids and everything else that life curveball her, curveballed her, she made time to participate and to be involved with the church in these various capacities. And I can't help but stop and think about what it says about her. Does it say that she loved the church and through that love was dedicated to the life and the well-being of the church? Does it say that she was simply dedicated and seeing that things needed done would do them so that our community didn't fall into a someone else will do it mindset? Or perhaps she was the someone else who did it. Thinking of this, I'm going to go ahead and turn my attention to the story of Jesus that we have heard this morning. In this text that would traditionally be read at Easter, Jesus approaches his disciples, and he does something that some of them can't even fathom. In fact, he does something that they fight him on. Some of them are like, ooh, Jesus, no. He washes their feet, and it's, it's a profound act, truly. It's something that we don't culturally practice, really. Uh, some churches and church faith communities practice it as a spiritual practice. Um, but this was, was more than just a spiritual practice. This was um, a life practice, a ritual cleaning. Um, and while we don't practice it today, I think there's a reason. It's because some of us avoid feet like they're the plague. But still, Jesus washes their feet. Something that culturally was the job of people in the household who would have been considered lesser. A slave would have done this. A woman would have done this. A child would have done this. But Jesus, the great teacher, the great rabbi, the son of God and man, heir to heaven and earth, sits and washes the feet of his disciples. And just to really hammer this point home, I want to paint a picture for you. Foot washing would have been a messy job. I mean, they didn't have, like, waterproof steel-toed boots to walk around in. Uh, back in the day, I don't even think they really had closed-toed shoes. Uh, they weren't driving around Fords and Mercedes and whatever kind of cars, Toyotas, and they weren't catching Ubers and Lyfts to get from point A to point B. Their version of carpooling was caravanning, and by caravanning, I mean a combination of walking and maybe if they had it riding a donkey or whatever else livestock they had for transport. They didn't exactly have pavement. It was dusty and dirty, and not to be crude, but I think many of us have seen the way horses participate in parades. <laughs> the custom of having one's feet washed as they entered their or another's home was an act of cleansing. It was probably pretty gross. Probably not the job I'd be volunteering for at the job fair, and a job that literally no one else wanted to do, so they made oppressed classes of people do it. 
and still Jesus washed their feet. I don't know if any of you have had the opportunity to practice foot washing as a communal practice, but I have. The church that I grew up in uh, practiced it um, four times a year, and it's very interesting. It can be awkward. It can be weird. Feet aren't really something that are super celebrated in our society. In fact, despite our walking practices being radically different than those in Jesus' time, feet are still viewed by many as just real gross. Because we stand and we sweat on them all day. We have them locked up in our shoes. And so what does it take for us to lower our position and to become a servant to others as we see Jesus doing here? What I see in the story of Jesus washing the feet of his disciples, what I see in my experience of observing my mother work and work for the church my whole life, and what I see in my own experience of foot washing as a sacrament is humility. And I truly believe that that is what servanthood and service is all about. It's about embracing the reality of who I am, or at least who I believe myself to be, and if needed, calming my own ego and remembering that there are needs around me. Communities have needs. From the very practical and tangible things that we can look around and see that need done, all the way to functional administrative needs. Communities and churches cannot function if people don't pour into them to meet those needs. We love our tradition, and with tradition comes a love of these items that add beauty and decoration to the sanctuary. And what would happen if the team of people who changes out these altar cloths decided that they no longer had the time to do so? What would happen if our wonderful Secretary Janet decided that the bulletin just wasn't her responsibility anymore? It would be interesting for sure. Communities are made up also of individuals who each have needs. You have needs, I have needs, and all needs range and differ from person to person. There are some people who need support in their grief or a shoulder to cry on in difficult times. There are some people who might need access to food, shelter, or other life essentials. There are parents and spouses here among us who might need help or support in caring for their children or their families. And all of this is to say that being part of a community puts us in a very unique and potentially humbling space of being able to serve. If you're ever looking for some light reading, I would point you to Simone de Beauvoir, who is an existential philosopher, and please hear my irony when I say light reading, because philosophy is a challenging, it's a struggle for me to read. I just don't get it. It doesn't click with my brain always. But she did make one point that I find really interesting, and she says essentially that one of the most difficult, maybe even impossible things that we can do is to put down our care and concern for ourselves as a primary motivator in life, and that we pick up a new motivation of meeting the needs of others. She says it's difficult. It's too hard. Most people can't do it. Service is important because there are things that you can provide to this community that no one else can. We are the body of Christ. Some are hands, some are feet, some are heads, some are hearts. There is something that you uniquely can provide here. Service is important because our goal and mission here is to reach out in love and to make disciples of Jesus. And I believe that that cannot be done until individuals have all of their needs met, or at least most of them. Service is important because Jesus lived in service, and he did what he did because he knew that his teachings would have an impact, and maybe he did not believe that he would see that impact in his lifetime or that he would see the outcome, but look where we are now. 
What liberation might we be lacking without the words and movements of Jesus? In preparing for today, I've decided that sermons on service are difficult because they are intrinsically sermons on humility and sermons on sacrifice, both which are difficult topics to pull into the self and to try to live into the self-examination that goes into them can be uh, stringent and difficult to get into. But we are still left with the reality that we are a community that has needs and around us, outside of these walls, is a larger community that also has needs. And I'm afraid that if we don't position ourselves to serve and at times even be served, our needs and their needs might not be met. So here's what I'm not saying. I'm not saying to go find the head of every committee or the head of every group or the head of all the ministries here and to go sign up for as many as you possibly can. That's not what I'm asking you to do. I will ask, however, that you enter into a moment of discernment. I understand that not everyone currently has the physical, mental, emotional, or spiritual space to add more to their plate right now, to take on more tasks or more responsibilities. But some of us do. So perhaps ask yourself if that is you. And if it is, ask yourself how you might want to partner with this community to meet those needs around us. It might require humility, even a lowering of perceived status. It might require sacrifice. But something that I have learned in my own practice of foot washing is that despite the discomfort, there is a beauty. And that in embracing discomfort and being humble through it, you might just come out on the other side with a blessing or a new way to see the world. May it be so, and amen.